Greetings and welcome. We are in 303. We turn now back to Mr. Conrad's Unstoppable Volume, Lesson 4-1. And the little red wheelbarrow. I'm on uh, page 143. In your journals, if you would, please, quickly. Just write down this as a uh, focus. The power of an open mind. Write that down. The power of an open mind. The idea that when you meet new information for the first time, why is it the case so regularly that our first thoughts are negative instead of positive? Right? So for example, I'm talking with a senior and the very first time the idea of going to college comes up, very first comment by her is, oh, I could never do that. Very first comment. Let's, let's take a look at what Mr. Conrad has to say about this. This is a brilliant chapter for us, 41. As a teacher, I always loved the first day of school. It was a time to pry open a few minds. I used the little red wheelbarrow as my crowbar. As the students entered my class, I would greet and hand them a 3 by 5 card. This card had their seat number on it. They had to look at the seating chart to figure out where to sit. This forced them to think before class even got started, what good teachers do. On the front of the 3 by 5 card, they had to write their parents' name, address, phone number. Then I would point to a sketch of my little red wheelbarrow I drew off a design I borrowed from Dennis Waitman. I ask my students to write five comments about the little red wheelbarrow on the back of their 3 by 5 card. This was my secret test. The little red wheelbarrow would confuse kids. I had taken something very common, in this case a wheelbarrow, and redesigned it so it didn't look anything like a normal wheelbarrow. And this was exactly the point of my secret test, to gauge their initial reaction when faced with something new, different, or confusing. Look at that line again. To gauge initial reaction when faced with something new, different, or confusing. Their responses had nothing to do with the wheelbarrow itself. It was to test their attitudes, positive or negative. Overwhelmingly, in the 20 plus years I gave this secret test, the comments were always negative. They ranged from, quote, it's weird, won't work, that's stupid, end quote, to personal attacks on the design or me. I often chuckled out loud reading their comments as I collected them. After I gathered their cards, I put them away. Then I would immediately tell them the stories, look for the pony, and when it's darkest, that's when the stars come out. Class time would end, and I never mentioned the cards again until the next day. At the start of the second day, I'd pull out the cards. I'd inform them of my secret test. I'd read their comments out loud. The whole class would laugh at some of them. Eventually, some kid would ask, what's the point? That's when I'd tell them. The point is that you are faced with something new, different, a little confusing. All I asked you was for five comments, and 19% of them were negative. I got very few comments like, quote, that's interesting. How does it work? I need more information, end quote. Then I tell them a real life story about the little red wheelbarrow. How many of you have been to the wave pool in our town? I asked the class, almost every kid raised his hand. How many of you had fun at the wave pool and are glad to have one in our little town? Once again, all hands went up. I then proceeded to tell them how the wave pool almost got washed away because the city council saw the project as a little red wheelbarrow. The year was 1985. The construction of the local power plant had been completed. All the workers left town. Many homes were listed for sale. Most didn't sell. The banks were closed. The town, it seemed, was going belly up. In the midst of those dire times, a tidal wave of controversy stormed over the wave pool project. Most of the town was against the idea. One local donut shop had a sign out front that read, quote, will the last person to leave Craig please turn off the wave pool, end quote. If I remember correctly, I believe it was going to cost $90,000 to build it. By a narrow three to four margin, the city council voted surfs up, the project was a go. The first summer the wave pool was completed, I had to test the waters. Even though we're a thousand miles from the nearest ocean, it was hang ten, as the local surfers say. Eventually, the roar of the waves was drowned out by the roar of my stomach. I was hungry and the tide was out. There was no food anywhere. If I was hungry, I could only imagine how hungry all the other little sea urchins were. Since there was no concession stand at the wave pool, I later called the city to inquire about putting one in. I asked how many people rode the waves that first summer. I was going to take that number and multiply it by $3 to $5 to figure out how much could be made running a concession stand. Our town's population at the time had drifted out to sea. We only had 5,000 people left on board. The rest had abandoned ships, so I was shocked to hear the pool had 40,000 paid visitations at first summer. That's a lot of hot dogs, plus a $2 a head for admission. 
The pool practically paid for itself. The city informed me they were going to put in a concession stand, so my plans were shipwrecked. Oh, well. The point is that the wave pool was viewed with a closed mind by many people in our little town, the same way most of my students perceived the little red wheelbarrow. The pool not only paid for itself that first year, but the city's been splashing in a tidal wave of money ever since. Not to mention, how many of you work there? I asked my kids. A flood of hands went up. I challenged my students to always keep an open mind. I told them not to judge people like they did the little red wheelbarrow. Later, I told them about Matt Pistorowski. Many kids perceived Matt as the big red wheelbarrow with his big red head of hair and his height. He stuck out like a sore thumb. Unfortunately for Matt, much of the time at our high school could be described as hammer tuck. And then finally, the unstoppable you doesn't judge a wheelbarrow by its color. Let's make a couple of quick points here for your notes in your journals. Uh, notice, well, uh, first one is an interesting question. I would challenge you to really think about this question. Why do we start? By the way, this is not just a rhetorical question. Let's give an answer. Why do we start so often with the negative? When we are met with something new, with something confusing, why is it that our first instincts are always go, oh, well, that's dumb, or uh, I, I don't get it, or this is stupid? Why do we start negative? It won't work. I think the answer is F-E-A-R. I think that's why. We're afraid. We don't know what the future looks like. We don't know what's going to happen. We get afraid. And so we limit our ability to see potentialities because of our fear. When others say, number two, when others say it can't be done, how about this? You be the one that says, let's give it a try. What would it be like to sit in a math class and the instructor throws a new concept out and everyone's groaning about how it can't be done and it's stupid and you say simply to yourself or out loud, let's give it a shot. It could change radically the way you see your world. Finally, don't, this is huge, don't let, let past failures turn you negative. Live with an open mind, even though you might have had certain failures of the past. This is the challenge of Lesson 41, the little red wheelbarrow. Thank you.